Hi folks, Canadian Prepper here. Guys, I need to emphasize that we have never been closer to World War III in our entire lives. We have never been closer to nuclear, Armageddon, mutually assured destruction, or just some limited nuclear exchange than we have ever been in our lifetimes, most of our lifetimes. If you were in World War II, I guess the nuclear bombs weren't invented yet, but this is the closest we've ever been in our lives. Now, you guys need to understand that uh, the, the Russians are going to be testing out one of their Satan nuclear missiles next week, and this could potentially put NATO on extremely higher alerts than they are already at. I mean, the word is they're already at DEFCON 2. Obviously, that's classified information. But chances are this thing is about to escalate. Now, the purpose of this channel, a lot of people think, oh, it's the fear monger. Look, I'm a prepper first and foremost. I try to sift through the information so that I know what's going on because the information in the fog of war is a commodity. We've talked about all the reasons why you are never going to be told the 100% matter of fact truth when we're in a crisis like this because of the propaganda, because of the crowd control factor, because of the government's desire to minimize panic and not shock the markets. There's a variety of factors why we would not be told the absolute truth as to what is going on. So we are on our own when trying to decipher what's what. I'm not saying I have all the answers. I would encourage you to try to leverage a variety of different news sources in order to come to your own conclusions. But I shouldn't need to emphasize why we need to do these videos because the fact of the matter is we are not going to be told 100% what we need to know to prepare ourselves and our families. Now, there's a lot of stuff going on. Basically, the situation on the ground right now in the unicorn, I'm just going to call that country being bombarded right now, the unicorn, because of algorithmic issues. And I'm going to be referring to the president of that unicorn as Zeke. Okay, Zeke is the president of the unicorn, which is being invaded by the Russos. Okay, so Russo is currently starting their eastern offensive. This is going to be big. They've recently got into a bit of a bind in Mariupol where there's a couple of guys, well, I shouldn't say a couple, probably a several hundred guys holed up in the tunnels of the Azastov steel plant underneath all these tunnels. I guess they've been preparing this for a long time. Now, there's some suspicion. There's a lot of rumors about what is so special about this particular place. Apparently, the guys there want to uh, the guys who are holding out there have requested of Kiev that they can um, surrender, but Kiev has not given them the green light to surrender for whatever reason. Now, they're really trying to open up these humanitarian corridors. They're thinking, I mean, that from the Russo news perspective, they're saying that that's so that they can sneak somebody out. Who knows, maybe it's NATO-related officials. I'm not saying that's for certain, but there's a lot of speculation right now about why is this so important? Why is this last holdout? Is it just symbolic? Because clearly they have the rest of the city under their control. And uh, this tunnel system that is housing these guys, which of course was the subject of uh, attention as a result of it possibly being a, a potential battleground with uh, chemical weapons, is uh, in the spotlight for some reason. Nobody knows why. Some people say that there's something there that they're trying to extract that they can't extract that they don't want to be found or brought you know, to the public eye. Who knows? That could just be total speculation. Could be totally symbolic and it's just the unicorns trying to give them a hard time and making them earn their keep. Now, there's some other big news brewing though, okay? And of course, there's airstrikes all over the unicorn. People need to understand that the thousands of places that have been targeted by Russian airstrikes, you're not seeing that. You're only seeing the anecdotal video footage put out by our media campaigns, which are trying to, I guess, boost morale, uh, do whatever it is they're trying to do, but you're not getting the whole picture. So unless you're getting that whole picture, it's very easy to presume that the, the Russos are getting their butts kicked. And the fact of the matter is, is that you're not seeing that the thousands of, of strikes on the unicorns that are, are taking place. And I'm not saying I, I'm a fan of that or I like that or anything um, like that. I'm not at all. 
I'm on this side, okay? But we need to understand what's actually going on with a clear and objective perspective so that, you know, we're not underestimating, underestimating the enemy, okay? Now, here's a very interesting article, all right? Now, Poland's emergency plan for a nuclear attack. Putin orders silos to be open. RS-28 Sarmatch. Sarmat missile is going to be tested in the next few days here. Now, Poland has drawn up an emergency plan to ensure the continu continuation of government and the war in the event of a nuclear attack by Russia. This is a translation from a Greek website, one that I find is very, very accurate and uh, is way ahead of the curve in terms of Western reporting and is way unbiased as well, but also not a uh, mouthpiece for Russian propaganda either. The, re the revelation was made by former U.S. Defense Secretary Christopher Miller during a meeting with Polish officials. In, es in essence, we are talking about a red alert in Poland. We have never been so close to implementing nuclear bombing contingency plans. This development raises many questions as the first to speak long ago about a nuclear strike against Poland was General Wesley Clark. And he was uh, the guy who we had in our last intro montage in our video like this. Um... The next few days are crucial. Russian information speaks of a test launch in the coming days of an intercontinental ballistic missile RS-28 Sarmat. This means that Russia will have strategic nuclear forces on hand, so the nuclear shield will be activated for any conventional NATO convoy bombing. Now, this is important because we know, or at least supposedly, the U.S. declined to do a scheduled Minuteman 3 missile test because they didn't want to provoke the Russians. Because you need to understand that the nuclear alert systems for both the United States and Russia right now are on a hair trigger. So any sign that something is getting put up in the air, that could easily be misinterpreted and that could cause jets to scramble and, you know, that could cause... Uh, a situation where we eventually we, we ratcheted up the DEFCON level to a point where mistakes can happen. Okay, we're at a time right now, even if nothing is done intentionally, and this is what people need to realize, accidents happen at times like these because apparently the, and this is, I, I've heard multiple different opinions on this, but apparently the Russian uh, detection system or early warning system isn't as precise and sophisticated as the United States. Now, I don't know if that's propaganda or not, but apparently that makes them potentially more trigger happy because they don't know, right? So they have to guess a bit more than we do about whether those blips on the screen are, are actually coming towards us or whatever the case might be, or whether a launch, because remember, you only have a few minutes with within missiles being launched to do a counter strike. And that is why uh, the stakes are so high when it comes to uh, nuclear war, okay? So, <sighs> Poland is really, really scared right now. And uh, this is important. And Miller's feeling from the polls was this is very, very serious. And you can see that in the fact that they're distributing these guides to their citizens now on how to survive a war. Some people have said it's a joke. Some people have said it's going to get people killed. You know, it, it's hard to say. Regardless, uh, clearly you can see that this is a threat that Poland takes incredibly seriously. Now, a lot of people would say the Russians would never, you know, use a nuke on Polish soil. And I would lean towards agreeing with you about that. However, you just never know. In, in Because of the simple fact that... Um, the, lots of weapons are coming through Poland into Ukraine. Russia has already threatened to potentially target uh, what they call phalanx, or uh, this is what the Greeks call it. It's a Greek word. Uh, phalanx, of, which is a collection, conglomeration of soldiers that are being transported, whether they're mercenaries or uh, equipment, you know, supplies, fuel, whatever it might be that might be being shipped into Ukraine, they may start preemptively targeting it in those countries. Now, a lot of people think that NATO is just going to jump into the fight right away. We've talked about why that wording in Article 5 is very ambiguous and open to interpretation. It's not a hard and fast rule that just because uh, Russia, Russian guy, you know, goes into 
Lithuania and, and picks a fight with a Lithuanian guy that NATO is going to just start bringing out the nukes right away. We know that there's probably a lot more leverage to that. And what we're entering now is a situation where the United States is seeing how much Russia will tolerate. That's essentially what's happening. Now, eventually, with the shipment of all this equipment, Russia has already struck Lviv recently again, which is to the west of Ukraine. And it seems like any time the United States starts to maybe go a little too far in its commitment to pledging weapons, Russia will target Lviv, which is a uh, which is closer to the Polish border. OK, so they start sending the missiles closer to the NATO countries. Whenever NATO starts to get a little bit too ballsy with what it's willing to give the Ukes. Um, Mos this article is called Moscow will cross the Rubicon. A message was sent to the USA for a military phalanx to strike inside NATO ter territory. An alarm has been sounded at NATO headquarters in Washington as a spe specific message has been sent from Moscow for bombing of a military phalanx group of soldiers or equipment inside a NATO territory. The threat is considered as extremely serious and has been sent separately immediately after the Russian um, step in Washington warned of global consequences. Okay, yeah, so basically Russia has warned the White House, Washington, that there will be unpredictable consequences if they continue to send in weapons. What those consequences are going to be, we don't know. Um... We are probably at the last level of Russian warnings. Putin proceeded first, followed by Medvedev, then Russian state media, which spoke of World War III and the fact that they are clearly at war with not just the unicorns, but also with NATO as a whole. The Russians are basically of that belief right now. And this is a very, very dangerous time because so Zelensky is committed. He said that he would fight this war for 10 years if necessary, a much different tune than we were hearing only a few weeks ago when we were at the height of those peace talks. Now it seems like all of that's been scrapped. Uh, basically, right now it comes down to what's going on in Mariupol. Zelensky has said that if you do not allow safe passage of these guys out of there, the, the guys who are holed up in these tunnels under the Azovstal steel factory, then, you know, peace talks are, are off the table, which they pretty much have been already. Russia has given them an ultimatum to surrender. They have chosen not to surrender. They say that Kiev is making them fight even though they have requested to Kiev to surrender. I don't know if that's true or not. So clearly we are in a stage of imminent escalation. The Russians are starting to move into the east. This is when the big battle starts. It starts today. So again, we are at the highest risk of World War III than we have ever been before. I can't even get into all of this information. I mean, that's the gist of what you need to know. But in terms of uh, the specifics on the ground, is there anything else that uh, we need to discuss specifically here? Uh, let me see here. Yes, yeah, so apparently uh, there is concern and this is from Bloomberg, that there may be an issue with sending these small defensive arms to Ukraine from the U.S. because they're just running out. Now, the effectiveness of the javelins and stingers, we're told that it's very good, but at the same time, uh, to the contrary, you're hearing a lot of other reports that they're not working as good and that they're being used haphazardly and wastefully by people who perhaps aren't as thoroughly trained as on them as they need to be because you need to understand these things are like 75 to 100,000 bucks a pop okay big big money 100,000 bucks a pop that's being you know completely wasted on the battlefield all of this money you know it's tragic but you know the united states has so many cities that are uh, in a state of derelict uh, abject poverty and here we are sending all this money to to uh blow it up uh it's sad now some people would say yeah national security is tantamount but paramount but i don't know i mean i guess it's debatable uh so the western allies now face a huge dilemma they may run the risk of depleting their reserves because people always knock on russia for saying well yeah they're not entirely self-sufficient in their ability to manufacture their own 
products. They do manufacture some chips, but Russia is actually a lot more self-sufficient than the United States. This is not me being a fanboy. This is just a fact of the matter because they have those sanctions on them. They've been forced to develop their own domestic industries. The United States, however, requires parts from all over the world to build these uh, uh, missiles, okay? And so because we're in such a, a crazy supply chain situation with China in lockdown once again, you know, there's a good chance that building these things is going to be more complicated. And I'm thinking that maybe Taiwan has a key role in providing the U.S. And this is just something I just thought of just now, that uh, the Taiwanese chip manufacturers probably pay, play a critical role in U.S. military equipment, in the development of that, which is why it's so important that, uh, you know, the U.S. maintains that, that relationship and which is why Taiwan is already in talks with the U.S. to build actual chip uh, factories within the United States because they know what's coming. The writing is on the wall with that too. Okay, so apparently one third of the uh, respective arsenal of Stingers, um, Javelin missiles and stuff like that have already been sent to the front lines. And the question is, how long can we actually sustain this? Most people are under the impression that, you know, this is bad for the Russian economy, which it probably is in the long run. But there's a multitude of other factors involved in that. I'm going to, at the end of this video, if we have time, I'm going to give you my devil's advocate thesis for why this war may actually not be bad for the Russian economy. And again, this is not me. This is just trying to imagine all sides of this story so we can be prepared for the worst case scenario all right now we have a large weapons depot near lviv which is to the west of ukraine which was recently destroyed uh, by russian planes so this wasn't by missiles this was by planes so clearly they're able to get these planes that deep into ukrainian territory i'm sure they're coming across maybe the border in belarus or something like that so they don't have to travel as far across uh, but that says that Potentially, the S-300 missile defense systems are, or sorry, S-300 air defense systems aren't as operable as some people have suspected in Ukraine, which means that the Russians have probably destroyed most of that stuff, to be really honest. Um, now, there's talks that Finland and Sweden will join NATO. Guys, this is a huge, huge red line for Russia. And this is, this is another story altogether, okay? If that happens, I would say we, we go up a DEFCON level. If Finland joins NATO, we go up a DEFCON level in a big, big way. This thing gets scary if Finland joins NATO. A lot of this, some people are, are saying that this election in France between uh, Macron and Le Pen, who's, Le Pen is like a more a far right, apparently, uh, politician who ironically is more sympathetic to whatever it is Russia is doing. And uh, some people think that if she wins, then maybe that will alleviate some tensions between NATO and Russia. And that might even cause, cause a bit of a divide in NATO. And that could potentially influence, you know, what happens with the whole Finnish situation. Um, it, it may just have a, a, a fairly significant impact, but again, it's really hard to say whether that'll have an impact or not. And uh, it could actually have the opposite impact. I don't know much about Le Pen's politics. I, you know, I mean, maybe if it was a German election, but France, uh, I don't know. It's hard to say. Anyways, uh, Zelensky has claimed that he's ready to fight for 10 years. So there's no signs of him giving up. However, I think that as the heat starts to be brought on Kiev, and if there is this lack of hope in peace talks, then you can bet that the heat's, the, the rain is going to start falling on Kiev. Russian warns of a potential run-ins with NATO in the Arctic. Growing activities of U.S.-led alliance bring both security and ecology risks for the region. A top official has said, I believe it was Canada who reactivated a military base in the Arctic as a result of all the stuff that's going on. Of course, if you have the 
situation in Finland take off and you're definitely going to have more stuff going on in the Arctic. So, yeah, lots of stuff going on up there. Big, big stuff going on. Now, U.S. Army using lessons from Ukraine war to aid its own training. Now, this is important. Remember, Dr. Peter Pry in our interview talked about how prior to World War II that the Germans were using the Spanish Civil War as a training ground for their troops to get them ready for the bigger war ahead. Now, this is something that is often not integrated into the economic calculus of the cost and benefits of, of towards Russia or to Russia for this invasion in that most people discount or at least do not figure in the experience, the military experience earned, the experience points, just like a video game, you have experience points. And this is something which is not easy to quantify, but you could say that Russia is gaining a significant amount of modern urban combat training, like modern, the most modern, as modern as it gets. Okay, yes, the United States had Iraq and all this, but arguably Russia is up against a much more formidable fighting force. And as such, they are getting something that's invaluable. And that is experience. How you calculate that in monetary terms, obviously they're paying a high price for it because they're losing a lot of equipment. They're paying billions, you know, probably a billion dollars a day. Okay. But that they're not, it's not all for naught. The guys who are surviving, the high ranking officers who are navigating these places, they are getting experience in modern combat, which could effectively be leveraged in the future. And this is why the US is trying to do the same. They are trying to, the army trainers are already using lessons learned from Russia's war against Ukraine as they prepare soldiers for future fights against a major adversary such as Russia or China. Now, we need to understand that these wars only ever will play out in proxy or they will go nuclear. So essentially, they're planning for a proxy war in some other country. And Ukraine just happens to be the battleground for that um, right now, unfortunately. I think right now the whole army is looking at what's happening in Ukraine and trying to learn lessons, said Army Secretary Christine Wormuth. These lessons, she said, range from Russian's equipment and logistics troubles to communications and uses of the internet. Now, I've heard it said that both the Russians and the, the U.S. are testing each other, okay? They're testing, this is like an equipment testing ground, really, because they're trying all sorts of things. And uh, they're seeing what works, they're seeing what the, what the weaknesses are. And uh, right now, Russia are, are fighting mostly Ukrainians or they're, they're, they're fighting their own equipment, right? Because the, the Ukrainians are trained mostly on Soviet era equipment. However, there is also, of course, NATO equipment coming into play and the Ukrainians have been trained uh, to be interoperable with NATO to some degree. There's even talks that SAS troops, uh, and this is from Reuters, is that uh, are said to be on the ground in Ukraine training soldiers. Troops from British Special Forces are reportedly on the ground in Ukraine training soldiers. That is dangerous, okay? That is dangerous, guys. Uh, that means that this war is getting really, really close to NATO, and it's just a matter of time before Russia makes a statement, all right? Um, lots of... Lots of stuff that we don't hear about. Okay, Russia's air defense shot down a plane with Western arms for, uh, for Ukraine near Odessa. So a lot of this stuff that they're trying to send in is getting shot down before it can even be deployed in combat. So that's why it, it's, it's, a lot of it is such a waste. Now, a lot of these Javelin and Stinger missiles were expired. Okay, they had expired battery packs, which really doesn't mean a whole lot. You know, I mean, it means that... Uh, you know, the, the lithium batteries or whatever it is they're powered by have a certain reliability window. Doesn't mean they're not going to work, but you could say it was old stock. And, you know, the military industrial complex, let's face it, they're having a heyday with all this because they're going to keep making money up until the, the big bombs drop. And hopefully they've made enough money to dig themselves a real, real deep bunker. Now, Anthony Blinken said that the war will last through 2022. Uh, 
not really going to put a whole lot of stock in what anybody says at this point, but it is what it is. North Korea boasts tactical nuclear progress. They're running uh, tactical nuke tests. There is remains of chemical weapons found in Sumy. The mayor of Trotinets, a city in Ukraine's southern Sumy region, say authorities have found the remains of sarin gas in a village previously occupied by Russian troops. We have found the remains of chemical weapons in the village of Bilka, sarin, and other substances. We discovered ampules. The security service of Ukraine is currently working on this. It is possible that the occupiers wanted to use this chemical to strike Kiev. Who knows if that's true or not? Uh, Turkey launches a military operation to Iraq. What else is new? Um, China and Russia are working on some kind of digital currency, and this is like a 10-page long article. I can't even go into great depth about it, but a lot of people right now are really, I think, underestimating the potential for this to blow up in NATO's face in a big, big financial sense. But uh, keep your eyes on what Russia and China are up to economically in terms of their trade relations and in terms of this possible digital currency that they're in cahoots about. We got riots in Sweden amid far-right plans to burn the Quran, yada, 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 nothing new there. But all of this, this battle between far-right and populism and all this stuff, history rhymes, okay? And I would not be surprised that if you had a new far-right emerge, just like you did you know, in World War II, and you also have the Russians, of course, and then, uh, see, there was really, there was really three belligerents in World War II, right? There was the Russians, there was NATO, or what would become NATO, and there was Germany. So we would expect that if World War III happened, it wouldn't just necessarily be a bipolar thing, okay? It could be multipolar, and uh, you could have people who are temporarily forming alliances and then later on in the war they war with each other things of that nature so it's really unknown yet what could arise but the situation is looking like and especially with this thing where what they're going to send uh, immigrants now from the uk to rwanda or something like that um you know you're starting to see you're starting to see the population that's going to be divided, just like we've seen here in the U.S. with the January 6th and Canada with the truckers and all that. Uh, this, this is only going to intensify moving forward. And now I'm going to read you a comment that I posted on a video. And this is just a devil's advocate comment. This is what I want, but this is just trying to look at, okay, because everybody thinks that this war is going to destroy the Russian economy and it's the end, you know, and that, uh, you know, NATO is going to get off scot-free. But let's just, let's just play the devil's advocate for a second, okay? I wrote this on a one-hour long video where a guy was basically making the argument. It was a good video, very well informed, uh, where he was trying to make the argument that basically this is going to destroy the Russian economy. And this is the response I provided. Maybe there's holes in it. Interesting analysis. Let's play the devil's advocate because I don't see enough critical comments. Really, all the comments in the comment section were just like, yay, this is the greatest thing ever. Okay, fine. Uh, but I like to, you know, challenge people a bit. While on its face, it's glaringly obvious Russia is outmatched economically, sort of. But let's consider some things. Europe cannot replace Russian gas. It's mathematically impossible, at least for the foreseeable future, for European needs to be met with liquid natural gas shipped from the United States or anywhere else in the world for that matter. Without it, their economy suffers and this can spiral into civil unrest and actually create a divide in NATO between pro and anti-Russian parties. Okay, so economic destabilization as a result of not being able to have access to Russian resources will have many ripple effects within Europe and could cause internal divides within NATO. As for the actual war, Russia is literally right there on the Ukrainian border while NATO and the US have to mobilize force over great distances, which comes at a much greater cost. Also in its current state, NATO loses a conventional war in Europe according to NATO's own war games. Now you wouldn't think this if you're basing your entire opinion of what is going on on the ground on all of these anecdotal videos posted you know, uploaded to Twitter or whatever by uh, the unicorn soldiers on the ground. 
If you're actually looking at the numbers, however, that are, you know, you can, you can um, cross compare what the Russian defense ministry is putting out and what NATO is putting out. Regardless, the numbers of actual targets hit within the Ukraine show a very different picture of what is going on on the ground right now, which would corroborate the idea that NATO would lose currently in Europe if a war was waged. They're also gaining something that has real material worth, experience in urban combat with a modern fighting force. Even the USA doesn't have this as a lot of the experience that they've had, yes, they've had experience, you know, fighting in Afghanistan and Iraq and these asymmetrical con conflicts with uh, countries which are not as technologically advanced. And uh, a lot of the cases, the United States has a massive, massive advantage in terms of air superiority, the whole nine yards. In a one-to-one -one urban combat situation, Russia is now getting this training, okay? If you think Russian economy relies on parts sourced from overseas, imagine when everything in every one of your inhabitants' households was made in Asia. That's NATO right now. All of our stuff comes from Asia, pretty much like 95% of it, okay? If we did have a World War III and that stuff stopped flowing in, oh boy, look out. It's going to be a lot of pissed off people who can't get parts for their uh, PCs to play video games. Sanctions have prepared Russia for a decoupled, multipolar world. The same can't be said for NATO. If China cuts the USA off after invading Taiwan, it's game over for our, maybe not our economy so much, but for the commodities on the shelves, it's game over. NATO economies are not primarily resource and manufacturing based. Their money relies on the capital siphon from developing countries and selling services, not material stuff. This is something people need to understand. NATO is 1 billion people, not even 1 billion people, 930 billion people. The rest of the world is 7 billion people. Heaven forbid they ever discover that they don't need us in order to survive, okay? If China cuts the USA off, okay, I already read that part. Uh, these developing countries, the ones I just mentioned, the 7 billion, need Russian grain and oil and could drift towards the ruble if they had to choose whether or not to eat because they were given that ultimatum by Russia. You must buy our stuff in rubles. NATO countries in Europe don't produce the things vital for life. Well, in Canada and the United States, we do. But not to a, a, but we don't have the sophisticated high-level manufacturing like they do in Asia. And shipping all of our stuff to where it needs to go around the world is incredibly complicated because all of the logistic issues with the global supply chain right now. Okay, and it's much easier for Russia, who is situated right in the the heart of the world. They can ship stuff to Africa, to Asia with much greater ease than we have to put stuff on ships and all this stuff, right? Um, oh, geez, I just got a phone call coming in here. I'm going to have to decline that for now. Okay, uh, let's just get right to this because we're almost out of time here. Okay. Whereas Russian allies do have the human capital and manufacturing base to trade, and China is a lot closer to Russia. The whole American dollar rests on petrodollar and the world's confidence in its reserve status. The whole high credit rating of the U.S. depends solely on that, including U.S. military power, which has its limits in a conflict with a nuclear power. In terms of fighting a country that doesn't have nuclear weapons, the U.S. will win that fight 90 times out, 99 times out of 100. In terms of a nuclear power, it's a stalemate. Uh, well, at least with Russia anyways, maybe not with China, at least right now, even though we don't know what China has really. Russia has proportionately much less debt. And I mean, it's not even in the same league, like in way less debt, okay? It's not even close compared to what the U.S. has. You talk about the Russian seizing assets and how that would contribute to a high Reddit credit risk for other countries. So Russia's seizing of assets of these companies that have been basically left or whatever. Some people are saying, well, that's a, a bad sign, you know, like for the credit rating of that country. However, the U.S. basically did the same thing with the 300 billion in frozen assets. You don't think countries holding dollars will feel the same way and trepidatious about actually holding on to a lot of U.S. dollars? I think they probably would. 
Russia's population is in decline and does have a brain drain, but the fact is, so is all of Europe. In all of Europe, the population is declining, and uh, many Asian countries as well. Sure, okay, the wild card here is China and Eastern countries. What they do determines how the ruble holds out. If countries want Russia's immense resource wealth, then this will fortify the ruble and proportionally negatively impact NATO, and it could cause civil unrest, like I said, within NATO countries who are dealing with the austerity measures that they have to bring in as a result of this. And then you're going to get a lot of pro-Russian candidates come out and say, look, we need to find a way to figure this out. And that, of course, would create a big divide with NATO and would piss the U.S. off big time. The U.S. dollar will wane and this will exacerbate domestic problems and spark another January 6th moment, but much worse in NATO countries. The fact is there are 7 billion people outside NATO who may just wake up someday and realize they don't need us. When that happens, look out. So, guys, the shit's hitting the fan. That's all there is to it. It's going to get worse. And look, we like to joke around on this channel. We're going to continue to. In fact, we got another fun video coming out for you tomorrow. But uh, if you don't, you know, this is an integral part of preparedness at this stage in the game. When you're in SHTF, prepping is over. You know, the, the time for prepping is over. I'm not saying the time for prepping is over yet, but I'm saying that as we approach the zero day, you know, information is going to become more important and all the prepping stuff is going to kind of take the back seat because once the prepping surplus is gone and you can't buy anything else to prep and you can't, you know, have more time to prep, then it's all about information and survival at that point. I got five seconds left. All I'm going to say is take care, stay safe, Canadian Prepper out.